SPLAD initiatives across a broad range of population health issues. He holds degrees from Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. Now, during the webinar, we welcome your questions. And up on the menu bar, you'll see a question mark. If you would click there and send us your written questions, we have time to, carved out to discuss these at the end. We're also live tweeting at the hashtag AskAINQ. So thank you very much for your time. And now on to our program. Great. Uh, thank you so much. This is uh, Josh Sharfstein. And um, I really appreciate the chance to talk about something that is a really interesting and new uh, option uh, for public health, which is uh, the ADT. And today, um, I'll be talking about uh, ADTs, a uh, little bit of background about them for people who may not be that familiar with them, um, and then uh, how they can be used uh, both across clinical medicine and then really uh, in public health. And we're going through a whole bunch of different potential uses. Um, and I will see whether I can move the slides along. OK. So um, ADTs are, as I think about them, a new and simple and powerful source of data um, that are very much underappreciated. People have a very good sense, I think, of EMRs, electronic medical records, their complexity, uh, um, meaningful use, all the different things that go into um, the digitalization of medicine. ADTs are a tiny, tiny slice of that, and yet they're a slice that um, can have a huge amount of value, both to clinical medicine and public health. So what are ADTs? Um, I am going to explain to you how I think of them, which hopefully is, is more or less right, which is they are essentially the message that the registration system generates when somebody gets to a hospital. It's the message that the registration system uses to open up an EMR record or open up a record in the lab system. It's, it's the way that the hospital uh, system of computers already communicates about a patient. So if I am in the uh, uh, emergency department and someone comes by and asks for my insurance and my address and what I'm there for, that is starting a cascade of messages across the hospital, and that core me, um, unit of communication is the ADT. And once it's already being sent to the um, emergency, uh, to the medical record system and the lab system and the billing system, a copy of that can be made and reflected to uh, another entity. And so basically, and that can be done very, very uh, inexpensively and simply because the message is already there and it's already being sent. So it's just adding another place that it goes and imagine that it just goes into a separate system that is collecting them not only from across that hospital, but every hospital in the area. In Maryland, uh, we, uh, the, the State Health Information Exchange, known as CRISP, collects ADTs from every emergency department and hospital in real time. That's the other part about ADTs. It happens right then. The same time that that registration system is creating the EMR record or the lab record, it's being reflected to the to the general system. It's not like there's a sweep once a day. It's happening while I'm still sitting there in registration. So um, the last point here is pretty important. There's really almost nothing that the hospital needs to do other than direct ADT. It's not like they need to do a whole EMR thing. There's no involvement of the EMR vendors. There's, there's a lot of the complexity that people just assume exists doesn't exist with the ADT. That's why I'm calling it deceptively simple. So what's in the ADT? Um, it does, it's not a medical record. It is really like a registration file. So it may have uh, the reason for the visit, kind of like the chief complaint. It may, if it's a have information about race and ethnicity, it will also have um, address. 
So um, this is these are some of this particular slide shows some of the things that ADPs may have, but this next um, slide shows kind of the core uh, of an ADT, which is uh, this first box ADT little hat AO3 is the con the type of ADT message. Um, it will have the name. It will explain what's actually happening. This person's getting admitted to the emergency department. It may have a, a bit about the core chief complaint. It will talk about their um, insurance company. And then very importantly, it will show their uh, street address and often, uh, as is here, their phone number. So um, you will have um, a lot of information that's coming in in a very compact message that can be immediately reflected from the hospital registration system. So what does it mean um, that uh, this is possible? So what does the ADT make possible? So because there are unique identifiers that can be matched to an individual across different settings, ADTs can be used to track individuals or clinical populations. For example, if I'm in one emergency department one day and another the next day and both of them are sending an ADT to a common place, someone can recognize, wait a second, there's a patient who's been in both places. Um, and that is enormously valuable without having to do the full, you know, um, query portal for, uh, for um, a health information exchange, you can know very quickly just with ADTs where people are across your system and with what frequency. Um, then uh, it has the home address. That has enormous implications for public health. It's very helpful for um, uh, carriers and maybe helpful for physicians um, because what it means is you know where the person's from. So it's pretty easy based on having all the ADTs to put together maps of the admission rates in different places, maps of readmission rates at any level of geographic specificity from a technical standpoint. It'll also include time, date, and facility information, which can be used to track patients in essentially real time. And what this means, for example, in Maryland is um, uh, physicians will sign up to be notified about their patients. They'll upload their panel of patients. And if, if I'm on uh, somebody's uh, list, say uh, my doctor's Dr. Dr. Gold. If I am in the emergency department getting registered, Dr. Gold may get a secure message saying alert, you know, sign in through the secure system. And it would say, you know, Josh is in the emergency department right now. And the, the, the uh, doctor is getting the message right at that moment. So it has this real time capability. It allows you to do mapping. And then very importantly, you're not just counting visits, you're tracking individuals. Um, how does this actually work behind the scenes? Um, this is a bit of a schematic that explains how uh, audacious inquiry systems work. There are others that are out there, but I think they generally work in similar fashion. Um, and basically, the ADTs, starting from the left, the ADTs are created by uh, hospitals. It can be created by urgent care clinics. Then a copy just gets made at the same time, like I was saying, it's shooting around the hospital, and ADT goes to a central system. At the same time, there are people who subscribe to the notifications um, under the rules that exist. So the subscribers could be uh, healthcare providers like my doctor. Um, it could be my case manager. It could be my, if, if you know, I have a specialty program like a mental health provider, maybe they would sign up. Um, it could be that um, uh, payers are going to be interested in getting um, notifications. Um, uh, to be able to track, for example, people who are frequently using the hospital and be able to offer them services in different places. Um, uh, ADTs are, been, are of enormous value to innovative design uh, delivery systems like uh, medical homes and accountable care organizations because, uh, you know, I'm a pediatrician and when I was training, you know, I would maybe get a fax a week later saying my patient was in the emergency department, but if you're in an innovative delivery system and you're going to get uh, paid uh, more because your uh, if your patients are healthier, then you really want um, to be able to know right away so you can intervene and keep the patients healthy. And so there are enormous value to uh, medical homes and accountable care organizations. I saw that when I was a resident by just giving my pager out to everybody and getting calls up by my patients directly. Um, but uh, this is um, a very uh, more foolproof way of making sure you know where your patients are. So 
how, how are ADTs used in, in medicine? Um, and this is important to get to public health because it's sort of the base of understanding how ADTs can be used. So um, I'm calling this the patient assisting ADT, um, but really when I say the patient assisting ADT, it's the same ADT, it just can be used for all these different functions. So as I was saying before, ADTs can provide real-time alerts to primary care physicians, behavioral health programs, and care coordinators um, so that they know where their patients are. And um, I, uh, when I was secretary, I went around the state and talked to doctors who may have been disgruntled about a lot of different things, but they love getting these results. And patients loved, generally, that their doctor knew where they were and could be there to help them. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, in Maryland, I think a ballpark seven or 800,000 ADTs are sent out a month um, to people who have subscribed to Maryland patients. It's very much at scale. Um, for certain uh, payers, the rates, the chances that um, a patient is being discharged from the hospital with an ADT going to someone who signed up for them is, you know, can be uh, well higher than people. Um, that most patients leaving their own hospitals now actually there is a, a primary care provider getting a um, note saying, up oh, your patient's leaving, and that gives a chance for all the follow-up that we want to have happen. Um, we're not talking in all in great depth about Maryland here. There's there's an opt-out system in case people are wondering, but for the most part, um, my experience is that the vast majority of people were very happy for their doctors to know that they were leaving the hospital and so that they could get uh, services right away. And we're seeing, for example, in Maryland, a huge increase in the number of patients who can be seen very quickly after leaving because the patients uh, are the, the doctors are aware that their patients will actually leave. So um, let's go up one level from the individual patient, the individual doctor, to a practice. So one of the things that um, is possible when you're thinking about an entire patient panel, and this has a lot of implications for public health, um, is that you can look at that whole group of patients together and their hospital utilization. So instead of, you know, my, my doctor getting individual, or in addition to, individual notices when, when his patients are in the emergency department or being admitted, um, in Maryland, for example, um, the uh, primary care doctors can have access to a tool that shows them their entire panel of healthcare utilization, essentially up to the minute in, um, in uh, timeliness. So for example, you could uh, click on one tab and see all the patients who are in the hospital or in the ER right this instant. You could see another tab, how many people have, who, who are the people who have been to the emergency department the most? Um, I remember meeting with a, a medical home, actually, at one of our hospitals, really great group of doctors, and they said, we're so excited to be on the hook to keep our patients healthier. This was a couple of years ago, but, you know, we don't know where they are. We don't, we're guessing at who our sickest patients are, because sometimes they will, you know, be bouncing in and out of different hospitals. They haven't shown up in the clinic. We have no way to know. We might get a report from an insurer at some point about what's happened, but we're definitely not finding out in real time. Fast forward a couple of years, because of ADTs, they're able to get a dashboard that allows them to see their entire practice healthcare utilization, um, uh, per, I mean, acute care utilization uh, through the ADT messages that have been uh, matched in. And I'll pause just for a second to say that there, there is a way to ask questions. So if you have questions along the way, I think you uh, hit the question mark and feel free because uh, we're eager to hear what is on your mind about this. So moving on to uh, other u clinical uses of ADTs. So we've talked about the individual doctor and individual patient. We've talked about a practice and how it can use this data to be strategic. So it's not just a practice is more than just a collection of individual patients as well. We've got a uh, extra staff that we're now getting, um, we're hiring to help us manage our medical home. Where do we put that extra staff? Well, let's pull up the list of the most frequent um, users of the ER and let's design a program around diabetes because when we look at our list, it turns out we can tell right away those patients have diabetes. So it's a management tool for practices. So it's great for individual patients, can be a management tool for practices, and then you can go all the way up to hospitals where um, hospitals can get 
essentially real-time information on, for example, their readmissions. Um, in Maryland, hospitals know right immediately if one of their patients is being readmitted. How does that work? Remember, if you go back a few slides where there's a sort of a doctor was signing up for their list of patients, essentially what Maryland does is a hospital signs up for its list of all the people it's discharged in the last few days. As soon as one of them comes in, boom, a notification goes back to the hospital. In Maryland, in fact, that notification also goes to the admitting hospital. So if I leave hospital A and 15 days later I show up in hospital B, because of the ADTs, um, hospital B gets a note saying, oh, Josh was just, you know, just so you know, Josh was in hospital A 15 days ago. And hospital A gets a note saying, you know, your patient just showed up again in hospital B. It allows for all kinds of real-time assessment, quality improvement, coordination, and ultimately better patient care. Um, you know, in, uh, there's a lot of attention, obviously, that Medicare has on readmission. But ADTs allow it for all patients and then to be broken down by, you know, well, where is the uh, problem in our, in, in our system? Why did we have increased readmissions at a particular time? Um, this uh, is an example slide that shows how different hospitals can um, uh, see, um, you know, get rates very quickly and, and at a system level they can look and spot trends very, very quickly around readmissions of enormous value to hospitals that care about this. And then um, finally, um, uh, from a clinical perspective, a clinical system can look use ADTs to look across practices and hospitals to see patients who are in more than one place and identify the highest risk patients across an entire geography. This is sample data, it's not real data, but it shows an example of um, looking at patients who've been to the emergency department many, many, many times and uh, it gives the ability for a healthcare system or a public health you know, authority or a Medicaid program to look across all the patients of all the different practices and say, wait a second, what is actually going on? Can we at least make sure that some very high um, uh, chronically ill population is, being, is getting the services they need to to stay as healthy as possible. So the last few slides have shown how an ADT not only provides immediate assistance for a patient, but assistance to the doctor running a practice, assistance to the hospital trying to coordinate its services and, and its systems better, and then ultimately to a major payer like Medicaid or a healthcare system. So I hope that um, kind of is good background to get into what I consider to be the really interesting stuff in public health. Um, so you've got this, to recap, we've got this new kind of source of data that is very cheaply and easily pulled from hospitals that you can very rapidly get population-based data on that can be uh, of enormous value to the clinical system. Well, what can we do for public health with that? So one thing you can do is map things. And um, you can look at any level of granularity with a map. And you know, I'm not, there are certain levels of granularity that don't make sense uh, for privacy reasons under certain circumstances. But in terms of the data capability, you have the ability to look um, at uh, admission rate, readmission rate uh, across um, any level of geography. This is a census tract uh, view in Maryland that shows uh, patterns of admission um, and allows the public health uh, authority at a county or state level to look at hotspots. Now, what's pretty cool about this, you say, well, you know, we can get some of this from an individual hospital, but an individual hospital may not know if their patients are going somewhere else. An individual hospital's list of high utilizers might not be complete because some people may be splitting their time, and a lot of people actually do split their time between ERs. This is really based on the uh, residence of the uh, patient. It's sort of the same unit that public health looks at, and you can get a pretty good sense of where hotspots are and, and, and where what is changing over time. Another uh, use of the ADG for public health would be, um, and let me just go back one slide if I can do that. So how does this help? Sure, it partly helps with individual hotspots. 
it also may just help to know what hospital utilization is like. Um, it has a little bit of a syndromic surveillance impact. Why are we having so many admissions in one part of the state? Are we doing more or less than last year? What are our trends over time? All that can be done just from the ADT. Um, in fact, some of the main syndromic surveillance programs out there are based on the chief complaint that come in the ADT. It's not a very reliable method of ascertaining diagnosis, but you know, at a crude level for, for looking at um, respiratory disease, you know, there are algorithms for looking at different chief complaints for that. So you can, you know, you could take that system, map it to the exact address, and you'd be able to say, well, we've got more respiratory disease um, on, in this case, the eastern shore, if that were the case, um, or what's going on over here. And so it, it allows you to have a real-time sense of healthcare utilization with some basic information on complaints um, very cheaply and easily across a vast um, geographic area. Moving on within public health, you can think about um, the fact that public health does track high-risk populations. So I showed you that tool for what a clinical practice does. A clinical practice, um, you know, will say, I want to know who my high-risk uh, patients are, that I'm their primary care doctor. I want to know who the people have been in the ER the most the last, who, been in the, who has been in the ER the most the last six months, for example. Well, public health departments track high-risk populations, too. There may be a special case management program for asthma. There may be a refugee health program. There may be a set of programs for people with developmental disabilities. And oftentimes, a public health program which desperately wants to help that group survive, you know, thrive, and in some cases survive, does has no idea if um, they are being admitted to the hospital repeatedly. Are they going to the ER every day? You know, there, there, there aren't robust systems for alerting public health when that happens. Well, if you think about that group of patients as kind of like a clinical practice, you could very easily sign up to get the ADT messages and get a dashboard. So if I'm at the health department and I'm running a, um, a home visiting program for pregnant women, you could imagine a dashboard that I would be alerted if any of them goes to the hospital. And you know, in each of these cases, you would have a particularly particular privacy framework to work out. But it could well be that if we're going to do home visiting, the person is going to agree because they know that the service is in their interest to alert the health department if they are going to go to the emergency department. And that way, a case manager could be responding literally in the middle of the night. We have a high-risk pregnancy. Someone's shown up in the emergency department. Call over. Hi, I heard you're there. Can I help you? Um, for people with developmental disabilities, uh, it may be that there are 50 different um, homes for people with disabilities, and in several of them, people are going to the emergency department every day. It's not that easy for the people paying for the, the for, for 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 example, the fee to to stay in a home to know whether the person is there, and maybe that signals a quality problem in the home. It may be worthwhile to know whether someone really may actually need, or may, it may need, mean that a particular person or set of people need more services. Something's clearly not working if someone's bouncing back over time again and again and again and again. And so you could imagine having a dashboard for people getting a set of services so we can just make sure as an early warning system to be able to help people um, thrive and not be kind of uh, in a, an inadequate environment. You know, I put refugees on here because oftentimes people um, come and they don't really understand how to help the healthcare, how to use the healthcare system. Um, it is can be very scary to go to a hospital in the United States. Um, you know, particularly uh, as the bills start coming in, and it may be that there is a program at the health department that is really helping uh, refugees uh, get the right healthcare. Um, that it makes sense to have a notification if somebody has come to the emergency department so that, again, there can be more comprehensive services. It's kind of like a cry for help to see people going again and again and again to the emergency department. They may not need to. They may be able to be linked into care, get someone who can speak their language, and this would be an, a way to think about uh, better service from the health department around a particular population. And there are um, some examples of this I'm aware of. For example, um, 
where a uh, population of patients tracked by the health department, the health department nurses are getting real-time alerts so that they can provide better care. Um, the next use, potential use of an ADT for a health department is uh, to evaluate interventions. So let's say the health department's focusing on a project like asthma and that there's a set of kids that are going to get referred to a high, high um, intensity health department program that's going to reach out to the family and help them get a good asthma plan together, maybe do some home interventions or home remediation, uh, and you've got the nurses, well, and, and you say, okay, we're going to um, really provide intense services, and we want to know whether they're working. And we don't want to wait. We, first of all, we don't have the money to do a huge evaluation and get the report in two years. Um, we need to know quickly. Um, and uh, one of the things you could do would be to sign up for ADTs, um, use the ADTs to provide value, to know right away when one of your patients is in the hospital or the emergency department, but also to try different interventions and see whether they're having an impact so that you could actually say very quickly, we took a population that in the previous six years, uh, sorry, the previous six months had, you know, 500 emergency department visits um, and after um, only had 200. And here's how we did it. And so, you know, one of the challenges that health departments had is to show the value of what they do because it's so expensive sometimes to do these big evaluations. But um, if you have ADTs and you have the ability to look before and after, um, you can do that quite rapidly with a lot of uh, validity. Now let's leave the patient population um, uh, scenario. Um, and I hope people who are listening or in public health departments are getting excited, uh, like, like I have been, about all the potential uses of ADTs um, to improve the health of the people that um, they care for. But um, we're going to move to a different type of discussion, which relates to emergencies and uh, public health departments have enormous responsibilities in emergencies and disasters of different kinds. One of the challenges is knowing where there are um, beds available. And uh, one of the things that ADTs can do because they know they can uh, track at any moment, if you're uh, compiling all the ADTs, you know who's there and who's not there still in the hospital, you can look at a particular institution and say, um, well, how many people are there? How many beds are available? Um, and you can use that to uh, help direct in an emergency where our patients need to go. Um, and th this is a little bit more of a looking to the future concept, but um, uh, it's information, again, that could be fairly readily gleaned from um, ADT information. And then, um, similarly, since the system knows where everyone is, um, you could stand up very rapidly a kind of where is my mother um, function where uh, you could see right away where people are. So even if someone's not signed up for the ADT, um, in an emergency, you could turn on a function that would allow one simple query portal to ask all, you know, to, just to query the pool of ADTs, is this person somewhere, you know? And if you think back to Hurricane Sandy and how hard it was to um, find where people went and people are calling 23, 24, um, you know, places to try to find their parents, it could actually be very, very easy to give um, access to this only in an emergency. You just stand it right up to, you know, a, a call center, for example. We had a, a story in Maryland once where um, uh, someone had heard that I think her father was in a car accident and couldn't figure out where uh, they were, what hospital they were at. And they called their doctor totally um, bereft and the doctor said, oh, I just got a note and you know, logged right in and found where the patient was because they'd gotten the ADT um, by a secure message. Um, think about that on a grand scale, not having to call your doctor, but just calling, you know, one uh, call center and everybody being able to find out where people are in an emergency. And then um, I think we're winding down, so I'm looking forward to the questions. Um, but uh, let's go kind of to 
a deeper level. over time. That allows you to track specific outcomes such as overdose, asthma in kids, falls among the elderly, and others, and look for patterns, hot spots very, very quickly. You know, um, there's been some incredible pioneering work in hot spots um, that required so much elbow grease to launch initially and really prove the point. But it can be taken to scale um, very easily if you've got ADT, an ADT pool of all the information about where patients have been, and you can match it generally very quickly with a, a data file um, with uh, discharge information. I know in some states, for example, the hospital association may have a discharge file, um, or it may be reported somewhere. You get that, you match it in, and suddenly you've got um, a near real time, I mean, a discharge is often the diagnoses are finalized a little bit afterwards, but it's a near real-time picture of all the different conditions that could exist in a community. Um, I wrote a, a JAMA blog called Using Healthcare Data to Track and Improve Public Health, and one of the things, the points that I made was that when I was in, you know, a city health department or state health department, we were often managing through the rear view mirror. We would get a report about infant mortality or falls that was based on data that the collection period had ended maybe nine months or a year ago. And then we would try to, you know, use that analysis to kind of set a course, but then we'd have to wait a bunch of time before we found out whether that was having any impact. And what ADT data does, particularly when you come out to a discharge a diagnosis, is it gives you the ability to completely accelerate that cycle, you know. Um, I'm not a big fan of the word disrupt when I read it in all the different, you know, articles about technology companies. But I think that there's an element of thinking about how to do public health differently when now you can actually manage the outcomes that before were part of annual reports that came out a lot later. And I think it has a lot of interesting potential for public health, which was the, the point of the um, piece that I did for JAMA. Um, and if you think about these different topics, you know, um, Overdose has a lot of implications. Uh, if you can identify um, places where people are uh, being seen so that people can, there, there are programs that emergency departments can do and health departments can work with emergency departments to do that can significantly lower the rate of relapse. As in children, you could look for um, community hotspots and go to those places and see maybe there are problems with pests, problems with um, uh, the code violations, uh, I met with one health department, they said they're doing this big project on code violations. Um, and I said, well, are you looking at any of the health outcomes? They're like, yeah, it's just so complicated to look at the health outcomes. Not if you can stand up a system where you're tracking the ADTs and the addresses, because you could just look before and after very quickly. So, you know, they could see whether having a big, big, you know, expensive push on, on enforcing code violations in a particular area is having an impact on, on kids' asthma, for example. And then falls among the elderly, you know, um, that there's a lot of evidence of different kinds of community interventions for falls, but where do you put them? How do you know that you're putting them in high-risk places? How do you know when you're implementing them that they're working? Well, if you have a surveillance system based on uh, very rapid healthcare data, you may be able to um, be much more effective uh, than um, just implementing programs and checking uh, in quite a while whether they're having an impact or in many cases, you know, public health just doesn't have the resources to check at all. Um, you know, there are different types of maps that are available in Maryland. In Maryland, for example, where this is done, we, ha uh, we have a bunch of public-private coalitions that are working to improve 40 measures of health and uh, a number of those measures can be tracked through health information exchange and um, the different coalitions now have access to uh, data at a zip code level um, directly uh, from the healthcare system that is, you know, updated as of, I think, the previous month or so. So it really creates a much, much more up-to-date a picture of health um, and I think has enormous potential for the future. 
So let me um, end with some thoughts, and then we'll have a good 15 or 20 minutes for questions. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out that um, a key part of getting ADTs to work is partnership. If you've got hospitals that uh, won't share ADTs uh, with public health, that's not a good, um, you know, doesn't allow you to get the value. But the flip side is, from a hospital's perspective, if they do share ADTs and they're used for productive programs, then it can help them under particularly uh, modern financial incentives that reward them more for community health. Um, and uh, there's huge value to hospitals, just as there's huge value to, to public health to figure out a um, non-competitive framework for sharing this information. And most importantly, there's huge value to patients. I mean, patients really care that um, their doctors can know that somebody was, um, uh, you know, that if their doctors can know that somebody was seen, that, that they were seen in an emergency department previously, that they've been admitted somewhere, they can um, uh, be uh, cared for better. And then um, I do think that there is just enormous value, even within the public uh, sector, um, to the Medicaid program. Um, the ADTs, you know, when I was at um, Maryland Medicaid, uh, which was in our health department, one of the, the common um, issues was that the Medicaid program paid managed care organizations to look at, to be responsible for populations of patients. And, but the, at the state, we didn't really have any real-time information about how those patients were doing. We had to kind of rely for quite a long time on the word of the managed care organizations, and eventually they would submit the data and we could do our own analyses, but it was often months to a year later that we really were doing the kind of audits that were necessary for the, you know, the real look at how things were going. Well, you know, if you could, you could set up an ADT and you could look at it not by geography, but look at it by managed care organization, and that would allow the Medicaid program to really have a good sense of um, who the uh, key patients of uh, focus for those managed care plans are, whether they're being successful with the kinds of initiatives that they're doing, what the key problems are, perhaps, within each managed care organization, and it would allow for just a much a smarter type of oversight than I think uh, oftentimes is possible. And at the same time, it creates great collaboration between public health and Medicaid because if Medicaid is looking and saying, boy, we've got a population of people between 50 and 60 in this community who are all having this problem, um, is there that they can look to the local health department, they can look to the um, State Health Department, can you design a program to take this on? We'll be able to follow the ADTs to see whether the people are actually able to get healthier, able to use fewer healthcare services. And then we can decide in the Medicaid program whether this is creating value for us. So instead of like the traditional discussion where public health goes, look at this paper, look how important this is, please can we figure out a way to you know fund this? And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. You can say, hey, we think this could work. You, you've identified a population or a geography where we have a need, let's do it, and in, in a few months, let's look at the results. And uh, it could create a real bridge between uh, public health and Medicaid, which in obviously many, many states are different agencies. So um, that concludes my uh, whirlwind tour of the various uh, uh, opportunities with ADTs. Um, it is really an interesting development in, in healthcare data. Um, I think there's so much attention paid to EMR data and query portals and adoption of electronic health records and relatively so little to, you know, the kind of uh, junior cousin sitting in the corner who is very, very simple um, in nature but actually uh, deceptively powerful. So I hope you agree with me and I'm interested in any questions that you have. I'm joined here with by Scott and Rob. I also want to thank everyone at CRISP uh, who um, uh, did some of the work that some of the slides uh, reflected, HealthShare Exchange of Southeastern Pennsylvania, the Merck Corporation, and others here at Audacious Inquiry. So I will uh, pause and maybe someone will tell me whether we have questions or, or not. And I think also people can tweet questions if they want to hashtag ask AI and Q.
let me, um, before we get to questions, let me turn to uh, Scott Afsal, who's um, one of the leaders at, at AI, as well as um, one of the senior um, people who were, was involved in the development of the Maryland Health Information Exchange, and um, see whether uh, I got anything wrong. Scott? No, I think you, you, you nailed it. Um, I think overall, uh, you know, the point is that you know, fundamentally there's so much value tied up in the ADT, but laying that framework of ADT connectivity just sets the stage for um, so many more opportunities from there. I think the, the great example that you laid out was the ability to then link in other data sets uh, and the reality that those data sets do exist throughout the country. I mean, many times we use the example here sitting in this room of Maryland and, and much of what Maryland's been able to accomplish and folks might say, well, there's a unique payment model in Maryland or there's a unique data set in Maryland. But as you look around the country, there are, are many states and Medicaid enterprises and hospital associations that do collect aggregate discharge data sets and, and the, the ability to then join that to a unique identifier created from the ADTs, a geocode generated off the address, um, opens up this, this whole array of really powerful um, you know, delivery system and, and public health system opportunities. Great. Um, we have some uh, questions. The first is, will this webinar be recorded and available for reference? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and we will... Um, also have the slides posted. The second is, we are a payer and receive ADT data, but the data is inconsistent from hospital to hospital. Most of what we receive is inadequate. What, um, for example, is done in Maryland, what does AI do to make sure that uh, the data is standardized and essentially what uh, Dr. Sharstein is saying is actually true? Yeah, that, so if I'll take that. Yes, up. please. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and I think you, in fact, we were talking about this earlier today. Um, Establishing an ADT connect to, connection to a hospital is, is generally easy, but there are things you want to communicate to that hospital on the front end in terms of what to incorporate in the base feed. Um, things like, for example, uh, is the discharge disposition uh, there? Um, are they including uh, the phone number at the time of the hospitalization the patient provided? Uh, are they including chief complaint? Are they able to provide discharge diagnosis even in the, if, if in the discharge message or some follow-up message? I think knowing how to ask those questions and how to engage the hospital to provide it is an important part of the connectivity effort. Um, we've been through this cycle a number of times, both here in Maryland and elsewhere, and you know there, there's a bit of an art to it in terms of how do you make fast progress with hospitals to get connectivity going and improve the service uh, over time, but getting as much a, as you can uh, up front without kind of really slowing slowing the process down. And if I could jump in for yeah, a second, please. I think one of the issues that can come up is that um, the matching uh, part of this is very important. So if the matching is not done well, then the individuals aren't identified across different systems, and so the quality of data that's going to go to a doctor's office or a payer or someone is not going to be that good. And I think it's very important in that ADT world that you have a you know matching system that both certainly doesn't match things inappropriately, but also is relatively robust and can be tuned up. And you know, in Maryland, we saw um, what generally would happen is that if there was a population that wasn't getting matched, we would look real carefully and figure out if there was a way that we could adjust the algorithm to make sure that they were matching in. Um, anything you want to add? Yeah, on? I mean, I just highlight that to the, that point. So, you know, as, as Dr. Charles seems pointing out here, when you send an alert, the methodology that we just kind of articulated here is not looking at the ADT and trying to figure out who's the insurance company or who's the doctor that's um, highlighted in the ADT, but actually looking at the patient identity and using that patient information to compare to each list that was pre-submitted, for example, in, in the questions case uh, by an insurance company and matching the patient in the real-time message to the member roster. And that match matching process is really critical to the service. So if you're only getting you know, an, an alert 85% of the time, that's not a good service. You really need to be in that kind of high 90s um, to get a reliable service. Within each message, we then need to make sure that it's uh, incorporating all of the key content that a, a given subscriber, like a carrier, would expect to receive and it's possible uh, to receive from an ADT. Ideally, what you have is some, um, it could be the state HIE, like it is in Maryland, somebody responsible for the service who is then responsible to making sure that it's continually improving. Um, let's go to the next question, which is a good one. Um, is there, uh, 
a movement towards ADTs being generated from minute clinics, given many patients are leveraging that type of healthcare delivery. Let me, um, it's a great question. Let me just say that we've kind of glanced over one point, which I think this is, which is, uh, well, and the next question I'm going to rope in, which was, um, if my interest, health department is interested in receiving ADTs, how do I start? So that's a good question. So how, how is it, you know, um, do, are the ADTs just, you know, tuning the radio dial to a certain number and then they all come pouring in? Or what do you actually have to do? And um, you've, there's got to be a organizing principle for, for why they're happening. Now, in some states where all the ADTs are going across all the hospitals, that organizing unit has been Medicaid. Medicaid has said, you know, we really want to make sure that our patients get coordinated care and we're going to require that hospitals provide um, the uh, the data and then the data becomes available and then the health department, you know, could show up and talk to the people who collected it and see, you know, their ability to use it for all these different cases. In other places, it may actually be that emergency preparedness um, uh, function that really drives the, the need for this, and you may say, okay, well, our emergency preparedness, we really want to know. There's so many hospitals close together. It's vital that we have the ability to do patient lookup. Um, out of an emergency preparedness, we're going to go around and ask the hospitals to contribute, and depending on the authority of the health department, they may be able to require it if, if that's um, nece uh, necessary. Um, in Maryland, uh, we did not have to require it. The, the hospitals did it voluntarily. This relates in part to our payment system. Everybody saw value from it. And generally what we found is that the more people were doing it, the more everybody liked it in Maryland. So it's not something where people were kind of pulling away from sharing. Once they started, they were uh, very enthusiastic about it. But there may be other um, paths to sharing. It could be uh, through the health information exchange and participation in the health information exchange for other types of um, value that is generated for the healthcare system. Um, so with that in mind, that there's no one clear path to getting the ADTs moving, the question about the Minute Clinic is, um, that's something that could be done. If um, uh, I'm seeing some nods, but you know, I would guess that uh, most urgent care clinics have a similar type of ADT system that is, again, opening that medical record. When people walk in, they're not start, you know, the red System isn't the electronic medical record system. It's another system, and, and an urgent care a clinic could basically basically creating one of these ADT messages. You just make a copy, do the same thing, and suddenly you can get uh, information on patients who were um, in urgent care, and that um, uh, is um, then uh, available. And you know, figuring out the justification for that, figuring out the legal authority if necessary the structure of that discussion is something that could totally happen um, locally. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've seen is that people, and this is a, a message both to people who work mainly with health data and then the people on the public health side, is that oftentimes in states they're, they're not co-located. You know, you've got the health department doing its thing under a lot of pressure on one hand, and you've got the health IT system really oriented towards clinical care. And having the health department show up and, you know, say, hey, you know, what's going on, wonder whether we can collaborate on things is actually very much welcomed by um, some of the people working in health IT. And it allows them to think more creatively about um, the uses of information that could ultimately um, provide some financial sustainability for the data sharing. As an example, um, that emergency uh, preparedness case, if a, if a state really wanted to do that and drive ADT feeds, they may find a very willing partner in, the, in, in a, either a hospital association or a health information exchange to pull people together to do that. And you may be able to write that into a CDC grant. And the CDC would say, wow, this is pretty cool. This state is now going to have the ability to do this in an emergency in a meaningful way because they know that ADTs could do this. You're really kind of just starting. And so uh, I think public health may think, oh, you know, they're so focused on clinical medicine, they don't want to talk to us. but um, I, I think that, uh, you know, my experience certainly was that there's a lot more common ground than people may think and that public health um, can uh, be uh, a way for services to develop that adds value to many different aspects of the enterprise. And even if, um, you know, public health is saying, you know, we have this really high risk group of patients, say it's a 
a group of very chronically ill patients. We're very worried about that, and we have this, you know, um, special way of financing them. A lot of states have certain high-risk populations under different financing uh, plans, you know, and you start getting the ADTs, you may be able to uh, pay for systems that are uh, relatively inexpensive, even out of the savings that you're generating, for example, for a high-risk uh, patient population. So um, let's see, we've, we've got a question on Twitter here, could be somewhat of an insider question, yeah, um, which is that, uh, is it true that CRISPing is a verb used anecdotally to look up Maryland uh, notifications? CRISP is the um, Chesapeake Regional Information System for patients. Um, since this is a, a webinar, I'll tell you my joke about CRISP, which is that the, the logo for CRISP is a crab. And usually when I was presenting in front of CRISP people when I was secretary, I would say, I'm not sure why it's a crab, although it probably is because of Chesapeake, but I'd say maybe it's because if a patient um, has crabs, you can find out whether they've ever had crabs before by checking CRISP. So, you know, um, generally the people at CRISP did not find that funny. But um, the, um, in fact, in Maryland, uh, and I was just uh, doing a talk yesterday morning, and I asked whether people use CRISP as a verb, and everyone raised their hand, that people say, like, you know, have you CRISPed the patient yet? Have you looked to see whether they have a, um, uh, information in the Health Information Exchange. My medical school roommate, um, who is uh, now at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, tweeted, you know, I can't believe I'm seeing patients and I'm still getting records faxed to me. Um, not that long ago, and I responded that I just met an emergency department doctor in Maryland who can't remember the last time that they did that. Um, one of the things with ADTs is that it really changes people's conception of clinical practice. Once you've taken care of patients and you know exactly when they're in the emergency department and you get a note the day they're leaving and you can plan around their hospitalization and you're not just wondering where your patients are, it's really hard to go back. And we've heard that from a lot of different uh, doctors that it's made um, clinical care more fun and it has that potential to do that for uh, public health too if you're thinking about a high risk group, which oftentimes is you know, can be frustrating in some respects to take care of, to be able to be there at their times of greatest need, to be able to be thinking and getting results very quickly about um, uh, whether different projects or programs are working it can be very rewarding and help um, actually address some of the burnout that tends to um, happen sometimes in, in very difficult um, uh, clinical and public health type situations. Um, let's see if there are any other questions here. I don't know if this reloads. Um, I think we may be uh, running down. Uh, Rob, anything that uh, you would add? No, I think we got, we got one more there, down at the end there. We already kind of covered that. Yeah, I said this is okay. the um, how do I get started. You know, I'll just say that uh, I'm sure the team here and myself just generally, if, if there's a health department out there that is interested in learning more, feel free to um, contact me. Um, uh, I'm uh, reachable at joshua.charstein at gmail.com, and you have um, also probably through the website ways to contact Audacious Inquiry, um, even just for general information. Um, and uh, Scott, any uh, final thoughts here? Nope. Thank you for, for presenting, Josh, and uh, thanks uh, to everyone else for, for joining. We are uh, appreciative for you to take the time out of the day, and uh, hopefully we'll hear from some of you and chat with you in the future. And, you know, let me just say one other thing. I bet that there are people on this phone call who have thought of great uses for ADTs that, you know, weren't in this presentation. I think the emergence of a, a novel data source like this really opens up a lot of creativity, and I wish everyone the best in thinking through um, these types of issues. So thanks uh, to AI for the chance to talk to everybody. Thanks for joining, and uh, have a great day. See you, everybody.